Brian Barnett is just a regular guy. He's not a doctor. He has no legal license in any field of mental or emotional health. Brian Barnett merely shares the insights he's gained from his personal experiences for anybody who may choose to use such information as he or she personally chooses while accepting full responsibility for his or her own individual thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and actions. Brian Barnett assumes no responsibility whatsoever for anybody's individual choice to expose himself or herself to any information that Brian Barnett shares. And by listening to this program, you're acknowledging that you, and only you, are responsible for your own thoughts, feelings, and actions. Happy Thursday, everybody. Welcome back, or welcome here for the first time, to The Last Symptom. I'm Brian Barnett, the creator and the host. I hope you're all having a good week. It's cold here, here where I am. We're having the first, what I consider normal winter, in a long, long time. The type of winter that I remember here in these parts from back when I was a boy. I know you folks down in Australia aren't having any problems with the cold. One person I talked to complained about the heat. Well, when it comes to heat or cold, I think... I prefer the cold these days. I can't remember if I told you all the story or not, but I used to love summer in Appalachia. Then I moved away to the Northeast for 20 years. And when I come back to Appalachia here recently, the humidity in summer is like nothing I remember. See, when you know nothing else, when you grow up with that humidity as a normal part of life, It don't bother you so much. (laughs) But when you leave it for a while, and you go to some place that doesn't have as much humidity, and then you come back to it, it's just brutal. This past summer, when it was 100 degrees and incredibly humid, I was on a backpacking trip in the mountains. And I had just come down off one mountain, and I was crossing the holler to reach the top of the opposite mountain. And the way that holler was closed in with all those damp plants, like a rainforest, it was trapping all of that intense heat and humidity right down in that holler. And I just felt like I was walking through hot soup. That's how thick and hot the air was. It was just brutal. So I took my good old time trudging up that hill, but holy mackerel, that was tough. So... I'm enjoying the cold weather now, i got to say. No complaints from me. Typically, I find that it's easier while living outdoors to stay warm in cold weather than it is to stay cool in hot weather. I mean, there's only so many clothes you can take off. And, uh, you know, it's not like you've got uh, an air conditioner nearby that you can just plug in and turn on when you're out in the woods you got to deal with with what you got let's get on to today's topic why do i say that the cause of borderline personality disorder is not trauma why is it a bold-faced lie or incompetence on the part of the professional community as a group when they tell you that the cause of borderline personality disorder involves, quote, unquote, trauma. Trauma. That word is just regurgitated everywhere you look, ain't it? Listen, when you notice keywords like this, getting repeatedly regurgitated, you should automatically realize that the person parroting these stupid words is not thinking for himself or herself. I think this is why I find certain words so incredibly grating, just like nails on a chalkboard. Words like trauma and triggers and fear of abandonment and spectrum. That's a filthy one. Spectrum. Whenever I hear anybody who's not a psychologist 
use that word, I want to pull my hair out. The reason words like this annoy me so much is because they're blatant indications that the person using them is not thinking. They aren't thinking. They're echoing somebody else mindlessly. You know, ever so often, my mind will be somewhere else entirely while my daughter's trying to talk to me. Does this ever happen to you? So she'll be talking to me, and I'll be answering her. But my mind is off somewhere else entirely. (laughs) And then I'll snap out of it, and I'll realize I've just been having an actual conversation with my daughter, and I didn't hear a single thing she or I said. I was actually speaking things while not in any way thinking about any of the things I was saying. Well, in a way, that's exactly what's happening when people parrot the incompetent professional community's choice of terminology. You see, they've heard these terms spoken by the quote-unquote professionals, and they say, well, these people are professionals. They must know what they're talking about. And so they take these terms, and they start using them as well. They're speaking a language about something they don't understand. They don't really understand. You know, the whole purpose of these terms to begin with is to allow you to talk about what you don't understand. It's a shortcut. The shortcut so that you can look like you know what you're talking about. You may even think you know what you're talking about. But the terminology is there to allow you to talk about what you don't understand as if you did understand it. On the other hand, when you're forced to explain or talk about things using terminology that you yourself come up with, what does this reveal? What does it reveal to you and to others? It reveals you truly understand what it is you're talking about, doesn't it? If you have to choose your own terminology to describe or explain a thing, There's no question that you either do understand it or it becomes very clear very quickly that you don't understand it. But if you can cheat by using terminology that sounds like you understand what you're talking about when you don't, it's kind of sickening. When I talk to you, for example, you've noticed that I'm often very choosy about my wording and very often, in fact, all of the time, I will speak of the same thing, but over the course of a conversation, I'll use multiple names for that same thing. Why do you think I do that? For one reason, I do it because speaking about a thing one way for too long causes the concept of that thing to devolve. If you just repeat a word or a title enough, the concept of that thing devolves into just another stupid echoed term. It, it, it evolves into an abstract idea rather than a concrete idea. Like the word trauma. So for the first year that I was doing this work, I spoke of the underlying cause of borderline personality disorder as distorted core beliefs. If you go back to my early articles and episodes of this podcast, you'll hear me repeating that terminology so often that it began to lose its meaning. Your brain stops thinking about what it is that you're actually saying. And that terminology becomes a crutch term that simply slips off the tongue with no thought behind it whatsoever. Well, you don't hear me using the term distorted core beliefs too often anymore, do you? I still talk about them all the time, but I regularly shuffle around my choice of wording. So lately you've been hearing more and more often me talk about misperceptions about fundamental aspects of life. What are misconceptions about fundamental aspects of life? Well, they're distorted core beliefs. They're both the same thing. Or you you hear me talk about emotional algorithms or fundamental misconceptions. 
or you hear me talking about unhealthy perspectives. All of these things are the same thing as distorted core beliefs. But what does me purposely changing the wording do? Instead of you just hearing the the repeated terminology, and, and instead of it just devolving into some abstract idea, it forces you to really picture what I'm talking about in your mind, doesn't it? And to think seriously about what it is we're actually talking about, don't it? So let's talk about this word trauma. And I'll explain why trauma is not in any way responsible for emotional disorders, once and for all. First of all, what is responsible for emotional disorders? The only thing responsible for emotional disorders is the unhealthy attitudes, attitudes of our emotional teachers. That's all. Nothing more, nothing less. Let me say it again. The thing that is responsible for emotional disorders is the unhealthy attitudes of our emotional teachers. We grow up observing their unhealthy attitudes, which then causes us as children to adopt the same unhealthy, erroneous perspectives. In what type of things are attitudes reflected? Well, we can deduce a person's attitude about something based on lots of things. Body language, abuse, facial expressions, silence, irritability, emotional reaction. You see, attitudes, attitudes covers it all. A father can slap his son upside the head. And that might send a message. But that's not the only way dad is sending messages. How else is dad sending messages? His reactions, his facial expression. He grunts when he's unhappy. And he seems to be unhappy whenever you uh, express an emotion that he don't agree with. Maybe he gets in his truck and he leaves anytime Anybody sad in the house? Uh, maybe when people are sad, he takes that personally and gets upset. You see, all of these things reflect what his attitude is, but it's not the things. The things are not the problem. It's the attitude behind those things. So the only cause of emotional disorders are unhealthy attitudes that emotional teachers live with that children then observe and adopt. But for those who are endeared to this word trauma, for those who just love the sound of that word, picked it up from some psychology professor, and now they just feel great walking around using it for whatever reason, let me just say that the reality is that most of the time, growing up in these sorts of families is not traumatic and if most of you with first-hand experience in this are willing to be honest about it for a second, you will admit this too. The experience is frustrating. It's painful. It's confusing. It's exhausting. But it is not traumatic. A traumatic experience. Think about what you're saying. What is a traumatic experience? A traumatic experience is being in a car crash and almost dying. A traumatic experience is being in the World Trade Center when airplanes fly into it. A traumatic experience is watching an alligator yank your child into a lake in Florida and disappear underwater with with him or her. That is traumatic. Traumatic experiences are those that happen in a brief, sudden, unexpected moment and that leave a powerful, shocking, lasting fear response behind, as well as all the symptoms related to being stuck in a state of intense fear. Traumatic experiences 
are responsible for PTSD, not borderline personality disorder. I know some of your therapists and psychologists are leading you to believe that borderline personality disorder and PTSD are related or they're the same thing. They're not. (laughs) If you have a therapist or psychologist who suggests that PTSD and borderline personality disorder are related, that person does not know what he or she is talking about even in the least bit. They shouldn't even, it's, it's unconscionable that they even hold a professional position like that. What is an emotional disorder? An emotional disorder is simply the natural consequence of living with misperceptions about the nature of feelings, self, and life. That's an emotional disorder. PTSD is not an emotional disorder. You see, in the case of an emotional disorder, your misconceptions create natural disorder in the way you approach and perceive life. You adopted these perceptions from observing your emotional teacher's own unhealthy attitudes toward these things. When you misunderstand the nature of feelings, let's say, the way you then approach life conflicts with the life you're living in, with the reality around you. This creates frustration, confusion, anger, discontent. PTSD is not the result of a learned, erroneous perception about the fundamental nature of feelings, self, and life. No, when the planes hit the World Trade Center and you barely escape with your life, your conclusions about the nature of feelings, self, and life have already been cemented for 30 years. And even after that experience, your conclusions on those things remain what they are. The experience of almost dying in a traumatic event does not alter your fundamental perceptions about the very nature of feelings or the very nature of self or the very nature of life. At best... You use these long-since-settled conclusions and perceptions as a filter through which you try to interpret and make sense of the traumatic event. A traumatic event can't educate you on something that you long ago formed permanent conclusions about before you even attended your first day of kindergarten. These permanent conclusions are unconscious or subconscious in nature, and you're no longer open to questioning them. They're they're set. So, in a traumatic experience, the resulting PTSD is not an emotional issue. It must instead be a physical issue. And when I say physical issue, this includes the possibility of mental illness. Mental illness is a physical issue. Why is mental illness a physical issue and not an emotional issue? Because mental illness involves the malfunctioning of one's mental faculties. Think about what I just said. Mental illness is when your brain is malfunctioning. A malfunctioning brain is a physical issue not an emotional issue. Emotional issues are the emotional chaos that result from perceiving feelings, self, and life incorrectly. Having an incorrect perception of feelings, self, and life creates, as a natural result, emotional chaos. A person with PTSD is not dealing with misperceptions about the nature of feelings, 
So borderline personality disorder is not a mental illness. It's not a mental health issue. No matter what the incompetent professional community as a group says in their official literature. Why not? How can we be sure? Because borderline personality disorder does not in any way involve a malfunctioning brain. People with borderline personality, their brains are not malfunctioning. Their brains are working exactly the way they're supposed to. They were simply taught to perceive things incorrectly. Things that we must be able to see correctly in order to experience inner contentment. And the only reason they perceive these things that way is from what they learned by observing their emotional teacher's attitudes about these things. So borderline personality disorder is an emotional disorder. It has nothing to do with anything physical. Not a physical issue. Not a mental issue. It's an emotional issue. The natural consequences of perceiving the nature of feelings, self, and life unhealthily. People with borderline personality disorder weren't born that way. They don't have an emotional disorder because they went through something traumatic. No. Even if they did have traumatic experiences, this isn't what explains the reason for their unhealthy perceptions. The traumatic experiences that they may have experienced still have nothing whatsoever to do with the reason they adopted the unhealthy perceptions that are at the root of borderline personality disorder and which they live with. The only reason anybody adopts unhealthy perspectives about the fundamental nature of feelings, self, and life, which that is, we just described, what is emotional disorder, the only reason anybody develops this is from observing the unhealthy attitudes that their emotional teachers, our parents, have towards these things themselves. The simplest reason that I can give you for why trauma, quote-unquote trauma, is a decoy duck in anybody's efforts to recover from an emotional disorder, in this case borderline personality disorder, is because it doesn't matter if you suffered trauma or not. It doesn't matter at all in terms of your emotional disorder. The only thing that does matter is what attitudes your parents had toward the nature of feeling self and life. If they were unhealthy and incorrect, you will end up with an emotional disorder. So do you see that you can live the most tranquil life of all time and still end up with borderline personality disorder? Trauma has nothing to do with it. You can go your whole life, never suffer a traumatic event, and still end up with borderline personality disorder. So in the cases of people who did suffer trauma, do you know why they did from their parents? Because of their parents' attitudes. In the case of uh, parents who were physically abusive, terribly physically abusive, why were they terribly physically abusive? Because of their attitudes. But we go over to another family where no physical abuse occurred at all, no traumatic events, and the child still ends up with borderline personality disorder. How is that possible? Because trauma and physical abuse, that's misdirection. Those are not the necessary ingredients for borderline personality disorder. The only necessary ingredient, the only constant in every case is that the parents had unhealthy attitudes and the children learned them. That's how they developed their incorrect perspectives on the things that matter for inner contentment. So where is trauma relevant? Trauma is relevant to the issue of understanding and addressing physical issues like PTSD. But it is not in any way relevant to emotional disorders, which are not rooted in trauma at all. They're rooted in poor, unhealthy emotional educations. So, let me end this by saying, don't come to me with a bunch of questions about PTSD, please. 
because that it has nothing to do with my work. Nothing with my work involves physical issues. I'll tell you what it's like. It's like this. When I was a teenager, I took I was having car problems. Now, I don't know a whole lot about working on cars. I know enough, but not enough to, you know, switch out an engine or anything like that. I took my this car that I was having problems with to a friend of mine, an older, an older friend of mine. And he did like three things on the car. Checked real quick, and he said, well, this has got to be a mechanical problem. I said, well, how do you know that? He said, well, because I've already ruled out that it's not an electrical problem. It's got to be a mechanical problem. It's got to be something with the operation of the motor. Well, this was a mind-blowing concept to me, that, that things could be simplified down to that so that you could so quickly isolate what the problem must be. Until that point, I had never appreciated that a car is made up of different systems uh, that work independently in a, to a large extent. Well, now today, you know, you've got computers also. So when you're doing an analysis on a car like that, then you would look to see if the problem is electric. Is it an electrical problem? Is it a mechanical problem? Or maybe it's a computational problem. Maybe it's a computer problem, programming problem. You see, what we're doing here is not a lot different, but it's a skill that seems to be out of reach for a lot of people. Every issue that they deal with, they think is a mental illness. And why do they believe that? Well, that be- because the incompetent professional community teaches them <laughs> to talk that way. The professional community talks that way, and in doing so, they, f- they present and support false concepts in the minds of people who listen to them. So in our work, we're, we've got things that might be mistaken as a mental health issue, and then we've got emotional issues, and we've got physical issues, just like that car. How can you tell what you're dealing with? The only way to tell is to know, for example, in my case, I recovered from borderline personality disorder. So I had to understand inside and out the very nature of what it is that I was dealing with. It did not take me long to determine that I wasn't crazy. So it couldn't be an, a mental illness. It couldn't be a mental health issue. I knew pretty quickly that it wasn't a physical issue I was dealing with. I wasn't suffering from high blood pressure. I didn't have gout. (laughs) So I isolated it. It has to be an emotional health issue. In order for me to understand that, I had to really understand what separates emotional health from, let's say, mental health. What separates those things from, say, physical health? a physical problem, like heart disease. Too often, people get entangled in these falsehoods and confusing confusing lies that the professional community themselves promote and endorse, such as you're dealing with a mental health issue. Again, back to me not being an expert on PTSD. I can't tell you the specifics about what it is you're dealing with. All I know is that it's not an emotional health issue. You're, you're dealing with some kind of physical issue, which might include mental illness. The experience might have affected you in that way. But, you know, it's not the focus of my work. So I, that's why I say, please don't come to me, you know, asking me tons of questions about PTSD. When other people come with other disorders that do not fit what an emotional disorder is, what the very nature of emotional disorder is, I can say that's that's not emotional disorder. Because in order for it to be emotional disorder, you have to be perceiving things incorrectly that you learned as a child before you were even in kindergarten, first grade of school. And how did, you perce- how did you learn to perceive things that way? By watching your parents, your emotional teachers, own unhealthy attitudes about those things. It creates a lot of disorder in life. And a lot of people have a hard time seeing all the ways, the extensive ways, that this simple underlying cause translates into, dis- into all these symptoms, all this disorder in their life, all this chaos. 
but it does. So we're just going to wrap things up here. I hope I gave you something to think about there with the, the car illustration. It just kind of come to me as we were talking, but uh, maybe I'll iron that out a little bit better and uh, present that illustration again in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, that's our show. Let me thank you again for the time you spent with me here. I want to remind you to support my work with a donation if you're so moved to do so. You can do it at uh, thelastsymptom.com. And while you're there, be sure to take advantage of my many free resources. You know, this is my, my car salesman spiel. If you'd like to schedule a one-on-one conversation with me, you can also do that from thelastsymptom.com. And here we are, ladies and gentlemen. We've reached the encouraging finale. Once, when uh, I was a teenager, way out in the woods where my family lived, my brother and I snuck out of the house late one night, and we were standing out in an open area, talking, just enjoying the summer night, an ocean of stars above us. Suddenly, there was a loud boom, and an enormous meteor streaked above our heads. It was so bright, so close, that it lit up the entire night, just as if it were the middle of a sunny afternoon. I looked at my brother in astonishment, and I saw him turned into a sundial. His shadow spun from in front of him to behind him as this enormous meteor zipped overhead. question my memory of that experience. I thought, surely my teenage brain is exaggerating what we saw that night. In recent years, meteors, just like I've described, have been caught many times on police dash cams and smartphones, streaking across Russia, turning night into day, and the sonic boom blowing out windows. My one fish story where the actual fish was in real life more spectacular than my recollection and telling of it. Mm-hmm.